starting with the four immeasurable thoughts. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from desire for friends and hatred for enemies. Just letting your mind connect with each of those. Love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. And then refuge in Bodhicitta. Sange chudon soge chunam lai janchu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chun yang ki pe sonam ki grola penche sange drupa shu sange chudon soge chunam lai janchu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chun yang ki pe sonam ki Drola pinche sange drupa shu sange chudon sogi chunam lai jajo padu dani gabzo chi dagi chun yangi pe sonam gi drola pinche sange drupa shu connecting with refuge connecting with bodhicitta And the Heart Sutra. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagawan was dwelling on mass of Vulture's Mountain in Rajagriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avlokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avlokiteshvara, How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that in the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avlokiteshvara, said this to the venerable Shariputra, Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. No visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on, up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. <clears throat> there is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. 
Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell on the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avlokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharivadiputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avlokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, asuras, and gandavas, were overjoyed and highly praised. That spoken by the Bhagavan. So letting the impact of the Heart Sutra strike you for a moment, clearing any misconceptions, any superstitions, any obstacles. Okay, so you can relax your attention. And uh, excuse me, my voice is a little froggy today. I'm getting over a cold. Um, today we're going to be looking at the Heart Sutra um, from the perspective of the Four Noble Truths. So the Heart Sutra is something that comes up again and again and again. And really, when we're looking at the Four Noble Truths, the real thrust of this course you would plug in the import of the Heart Sutra in the final two truths. Or excuse, so if you think about the Four Noble Truths, they're framed in terms of causes and effects. And they're also terms framed in terms of problems and antidotes. There's lots of different ways of approaching them. But if you want to access the Third and Fourth Noble Truth, one of the best ways is to meditate on the Heart Sutra. So that's just kind of a side note, a, a plug to keep reading it again and again and as many commentaries as you can on it. Uh, one of my favorite commentaries on the Heart Sutra is called Essence of the Heart Sutra by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And it's not very long, but it's very deep and uh, very pithy. So that's the uh, recommended reading for the day. Okay, so when we think about the Four Noble Truths, the Four Noble Truths being the truth of suffering, the truth of origin, the truth of cessation, and the truth of path, that these were the very first things that the Buddha discussed after his enlightenment. And it, I think it's interesting to, to kind of muse a bit about why is it that this is what he taught first. He had just achieved enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, he was radiant and gleaming and, you know, very much different than he was days before, apparently, right? And his five best friends, who he had been doing all of these Vedic practices with and lots of ascetic practices with, saw him glorified and just shining and radiant and also eating solid food. Oh, horror. And, you know, and they were kind of startled to see this change in him. We can imagine this scene, right? And you know, they're sort of horrified that he's like eating solid food and he's not being such a an ascetic anymore. And yet obviously something's going well because he's so radiant and so peaceful and so happy. And so they come to him and they say, what have you been doing? How did you get this way? And then he teaches the Four Noble Truths. And the way he taught them, the order is significant. 
he taught something accessible and knowable and almost, um, you know, almost a little coarse at first, something obvious. He taught that there is suffering. There is suffering. To which all people would say, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're suffering. So what? Explain, you know, is it inevitable? Is it not inevitable? Is it our cause? Is it caused from some creator entity? Is it a combination of things? Where does it come from? But yeah, suffering is not controversial. <laughs> yeah, he started with something that is basically a result, a result. And framing suffering as a result makes you ask questions about the cause. So he started out with the accessible, there's the suffering of suffering. There's the fact that our body does not cooperate. It ages, it gets sick, it dies. This body is not totally under our own control. We could eat all of the best food, we could do all of the correct exercise and still not live out the lifespan we expect to. I just found out today, actually, that someone I went to high school with passed away. And it, it always kind of shocks you. But why should it? You know, and I think, well, he was the same age as me. He was in his 40s. And, you know, he was relatively healthy and, you know, seemed like he had the whole next half of his life ahead of him. And he passed away. And, you know, we're kind of shocked again and again when we hear about the deaths of people our same age, particularly as if we're somehow a special case or death only happens to the old, the very, very old. And yet we know a million examples of that not being the case, of healthy people dying before sick people every day, of young people dying before old people every day. We already know this, and yet we have this innate grasping at permanence. And that is something that is making the spiritual path very difficult for us, this grasping at permanence, because it means that we are fooling ourselves about how much time we have to practice. And even when you get into a prioritization of spiritual practice, still there's all these little escape routes we build for ourselves that lets us off the hook from doing the deepest practice we could, because in the back of our mind is, I still have time. And in one sense, we do. We have time. We have plenty of time. Even if we die today, another rebirth, we will have time. But is that time going to be spent in the spiritual path only if the habit is strong? Only if the habit is strong. So I often think about how important it is to look at your relationship to your spiritual path, not just what it is and what you're doing, your relationship to it is so important because if you love your practice, even if you die today, you'll pick it up again in your next life, happily, joyfully, when you meet with the conditions. But if you have an angsty relationship with your spiritual practice, if you have a competitive relationship with your spiritual practice, if you have a performative relationship with your spiritual practice, if you have a depressed relationship with your spiritual practice, those are habits that will carry along. If you die today, your next rebirth, you might come across beautiful teachings and part of you has a grief response or part of you has an aversion. And that's not what we want. So your approach to your spiritual path is as important as the path. So asking ourselves, are we approaching it with consistency and curiosity and openness without pressure? Are we approaching discipline as a form of self-care, not discipline as a form of like weaponizing the spiritual path against ourselves about why we're so lazy and bad? You know, the approach is so important. So the Buddha started out talking about suffering and, you know, at first it sounds like, well, that's quite depressing. Why is he talking about suffering and aging and death and sickness and all of these things that we know all too well? Why is he talking about them? Well, on one level, it's to make us curious about the cause. On another level, it's to break through the spell of grasping at permanence. Yeah, it's like, remember what you already know. Remember that death is coming. Remember that even if you feel healthy and well today, you can get sick tomorrow. 
don't take it for granted what's good in your life. Really lean into the good and the supports in your life because all of them are transient. Might get better, sure. But we really can kind of take it for granted as soon as we start feeling we've got it all together. I'm just going to relax a bit until I've got the mental space and the energy to engage at the spiritual path. Keep the relaxation and then engage. <laughs> Don't take the relaxation as a kind of slipping into old habits. So the first noble truth, there is suffering. There is suffering of the body, then there is suffering of the mind. And in a way, it's refreshing to hear someone say that, that the mind suffers suddenly makes you feel connected to the human race. Because sometimes we can fall into the trap of thinking that there is something fundamentally wrong with us, that we can't ever be 100% content. That, you know, those rare moments where life is going smoothly, those magic moments where the family's getting along and the household is in order and things are kind of clean enough and tidy enough for a sec and everything's together that even then it's hard to relax into contentment. And that also when you get what you want, that it doesn't feel like enough. You might get the house renovation done. You might get the trip of the lifetime. You might find a good partner. Your children might achieve the success you hoped for them. Things might go just as you wished and still you're not content. And then you wonder what is wrong with you that you can't just be content. And the Buddha is saying that is built into a mind under the influence of innate ignorance. So we don't just have innate grasping at permanence. We have innate grasping at something very fundamentally problematic, which is grasping at inherent existence. So that type of ignorance is the real driving force of samsara or cyclic existence. And because of that ignorance... We have attachment, desire, we have anger, we have jealousy, we have pride. We have all these things that then reinforce negative habit patterns and keep us trapped in these cycles. And so starting by just saying this is how it is, you can stop for a second and say, oh, I'm not alone. I'm not alone in not having my act together. Or I'm not alone in not being content even when I do have my act together. It, it, it actually can be quite refreshing to realize that all of us have that little edge of discontent. And you also start to wonder, why is that? If that's true for me and that's true for all living beings, how come? Yeah. And so then the next noble truth is the cause or the origin of suffering. And so that's a very brilliant teaching style that he taught the cause first or he taught the result first, excuse me, then he taught the cause, right? You're like, okay, here's how things are. Then you have the why, 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 why? So why is there suffering? Why is there suffering? And before you really dig into it, you might think, well, there's suffering because people are selfish. <laughs> there is suffering because the world is full of war and full of natural disasters and full of greedy people and fill, filled with, you know, bad government choices. And, you know, you go into the details of suffering as in the conditions for suffering, which do exist, but they're not the fundamental cause. The fundamental cause is karma and disturbing emotions. Karma and disturbing emotions built upon that innate ignorance. So then you become very curious. All right, well, is that just inevitable? Is that the way things are? And the Buddha says, no, I'm going to tell you about another result. I'm going to tell you about the truth of cessation. I'm going to tell you about the way in which suffering can cease or end. I'm going to tell you that liberation is possible. And then you wonder why. And then he explains why. And from the Pali tradition perspective, the truth of path is described in terms of the Noble Eightfold Path. And from the Sanskrit tradition, it's spoken much more in terms of just going right to the root of the issue and developing the wisdom, realizing emptiness. And so these two ideas of the path 
really come into play when you look at something like the Heart Sutra. You wonder, how do I access that kind of wisdom? How do I really break the spell of samsara? How do I interrupt the continuity of these negative habits? And so looking at the truth of path, you're really developing this understanding that the big priority in our life needs to be stopping the habit of ignorance and developing a habit of wisdom. And that that starts with the very mind that you have now. The mind that you have now is fine. It's plenty. It just needs active analysis into the nature of reality again and again and again. And as you start to understand the causes of suffering and the causes of liberation, hopefully it occurs to you that other people would like to get out of this mess as well. And you bring in the motivation of bodhicitta to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. So these are the Four Noble Truths just kind of in a nutshell, and we'll unpack them one by one in this series. But I think it's good to just kind of have an overview of here's what we're talking about. It was the first teaching of the Buddha. It was significant in many ways and also incredibly relevant. So I thought now we'll just dig into the first one. Okay. So the first noble truth, suffering, <clears throat> it's an effect of karma and disturbing emotions from innate ignorance, maintained by desire, etc., and here I like to think of a verse from Lama Chopa, one of our one of our very favorite prayers in our tradition, Lama Chopa Guru Puja. And verse 90 says, there is no difference between ourselves and others in that none of us wishes even the slightest of sufferings or is ever content with the happiness we have. Realizing this, we seek your blessings that we may enhance the bliss and joy of others. So you're leveling the playing field. You're thinking, all right, people are very unique. People are very diverse. And yet at the core, if there was a core, there is no difference. We just do not want to suffer. And yet we're never content with the happiness we have. So realizing this, we seek blessings. What does that mean? Seek blessings, seek blessings. We want inspiration, we want support, we want connection from the divine, from the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, from our own nature, support to actually work for the welfare of others, to enhance the bliss and joy of others. So thinking of that as kind of our core motivation for studying the first noble truth, then we get into the details. So here's where I was talking about the suffering of suffering. We ordinarily consider suffering, physical and mental pain. Then the next level more subtle is the suffering of change. The experiences we ordinarily consider as pleasurable. They aren't real happiness because they are merely a temporary relief from the previous discomfort or suffering. And the previous discomfort or suffering will return once again. And then there's the pervasive suffering. And I'll get into that in a minute. So the suffering of change, really meditating on the suffering of change is one of the quickest ways to develop what is called renunciation or the determination to be free from samsara. Because here you're looking at your relationship with pleasure. And in Buddhism, no one is saying you're not allowed pleasure or you're not allowed happiness. In fact, the whole point is to develop more and more pure forms and stable forms of happiness. But by looking at your relationship to what you think makes you happy, as opposed to the actual causes of happiness, you can stop doing all the fluff on the top that actually never was the goods to begin with. So we first start looking at something pleasurable. We take some, you know, ordinary example that we can all relate to. And uh, a common example is to think about a beautiful day at the beach when the temperature is nice. Okay, beautiful day at the beach, the temperature is nice. Say you've got your friends and your family there, everybody's getting along, and there's delicious snacks and blankets to lie down on. Okay, nice day. Yeah, nice day at the beach. How is this suffering? <laughs> and then try and picture yourself, picture yourself at a day at the beach. 
and you're sitting on the blanket and you're looking at the sea and for a moment you're content as content as you can be in samsara and you know you're noticing life's rich pageant you're noticing your friends talking and chatting the children playing and making sand castles and the beauty of the sea how wonderful it is and you're really quite happy for about five to ten minutes <laughs> and after about five to ten minutes you either get a little bit bored or a little bit restless or you want to add something. Maybe I should read a book. Maybe I should eat something. Maybe I should do some stretches. Maybe I should go for a run. Maybe I should go into the sea. Restlessness arises. And you think, okay, I'm going to go into the sea, the beautiful sea. And then you dive into the sea and it's cold at first. And then your body adjusts and you're so happy. And you're swimming and the waves pick you up and set you down and pick you up and set you down. And it's just so blissful, like being in the womb or being rocked in a cradle. It's just so lovely. And the waves aren't too much that day, but they're enough to be exciting. Oh, how wonderful it is for five to ten minutes. Then you get a little bit cold and a little bit chilled and you go back to the blanket. And you think, oh, how nice to be in the sun again and warm up. Oh, how nice to be out of the cold sea. And then you get a little warm and you start to notice the sand is aggravating you and the angle of the sun is annoying you. And now you're worried about getting burned. And now someone's kicked sand onto your sandwiches. And now you realize that the pop isn't cold anymore, etc. So what we're really doing on a good day, this is a good day, never mind a bad day. On a good day is we're just kind of rolling through the different sensory experiences, trying to get them to make fun for us. So we look at something until we're bored, then we eat something until we're bored, then we touch or do something physical until we're bored, we listen to something until we're bored, and we just kind of rotate through the senses, trying to get them to entertain us. And there's a moment in time where maybe all of the senses seem to be collaborating and you have a moment of peace or joy or happiness for a moment. And then very soon on its tails is, I wish this was a little better or a little longer or a little more. Yeah. So what we take to be pleasure is actually the beginnings of suffering. Yeah, and the suffering increases, increases, and then we do something about it. And then we have a relief of suffering, which we take to be happiness. Like how nice it is to sit down after standing. It's actually just relief of the pain of standing. And how wonderful it is to stand up when you've been sitting too long. But it's really just relief from the suffering of sitting. So this is how we are. This is the suffering of change. There is no moment of stable consistent happiness in our lives. And knowing that, you can again start to break the spell of needing to chase entertainments of the senses and come to the realization that the most stable contentment you've had so far has been that that your mind has generated. Your mind is generated. Your mind can make something a good day or a bad day. The senses are a little bit more flighty and problematic. Trying to give, get them to be the ones that give you contentment is not so stable as working on your mental state or working on your mood, for example. Working on your sense of connection to your fellow man, working on your sense of how to be of benefit to others. Because that same beach experience can be better or worse based on the mood you bring to it. That's quite obvious. So how do you orchestrate a good mood? Well, you can't think... I want a good mood. <laughs> yeah, you'll ruin it for yourself. I hope today is a good day and that I have lots of fun and lots of enjoyment. You ruin it for yourself. If you think, how can I be of benefit to others? Actually, you might wind up having a lovely day. How to be of benefit to others, not in a martyred way, not in a controlling way that's trying to force them to have a good time, but just in that open, spacious, hosting way. How can I make sure they have what they need? That, that can start to bring about real sense of fulfillment. And the reason for that is that that state of mind waters positive seeds of positive karma you've created in the past. So you can get back to back good karmic seeds ripening. So you have more continuous happiness. 
Of course, you'll get distracted and a negative seed will arise and be watered. However, you're more likely to have more contentment and more happiness if your mental state is under more control. And then if it rains, it's a grand adventure, not a disaster. Then if your car breaks down, it's kind of hilarious and absurd, not a big tragedy or a sense of something that's going to bring all sorts of grief and rage and grumpiness. You know, then if something goes not according to plan, it gets woven in to your good mood and you just can roll with it. And what we're doing on the spiritual path is trying to increase our capacity to weave more into a good mood so that less and less are we under the dictatorship that we've given ourselves of needing certain conditions to be happy and telling ourselves we can't be happy unless things code just according to plan. So the suffering of change is interesting and it's, it's a good invitation to start looking at impermanence, the way things change. It's a good way to look at your own grasping at permanence and the way that you assume stability is possible and yet it never has been really. And that the best stability that you can rely on is the stability you build into your own mind. But really life, even, even if you've lived in the same house for 20 years, is it stable or is there always some sort of house maintenance to be done? You know, you have a good friend for 20 years, still there's different chapters of closeness and distance even within one day. So when we think about the suffering of change, it really can help you get into that go with the flow mentality in a much deeper way because you realize you really have no other choice if you want any kind of contentment. Otherwise, you're just going against the tide. Questions about those first two or thoughts about those first two, the suffering of suffering and the suffering of change? What does it bring up? First off, I just thought it was really interesting. I had never really heard it explained that the difference between the Pali and the Sanskrit tradition in terms of the focus of the um, the fourth noble truth, you know, with the Sanskrit being more sort of directed at emptiness. And it's like, oh, yeah, that, that does make a lot of sense. Um, uh, you know, not that it dismisses all the other points of, of the Eightfold Path, but... Um, I don't know, that, that's an interesting, just something that I thought. And and um, so the Heart Sutra itself, does it, I'm forgetting for the moment, is, is there like an explicit mention of bodhicitta in there or is it sort of implied somehow or? It's, it's implied in the sense that Shariputra is asking Avalokiteshvara how to do what he's doing, and he is a great bodhisattva. So he's also saying how to achieve the perfection of wisdom. So if it was just wisdom, it would be just wisdom. But if it's the perfection of wisdom, it necessarily has bodhicitta, right? Because it's only a perfection if there is bodhicitta together with it. So it's not like it's like headinged, you know, like this is in order to become a Buddha, but it's peppered throughout with the references of the perfection of wisdom and it being taught by a bodhisattva and Shariputra wanting to basically be like Avalokiteshvara. Yeah. And and the other, one other thing, and then I'll give Maureen a, a chance. Um, I, um, the, you know, in terms of the suffering of change and how focusing on bodhicitta can kind of alleviate your suffering, you know, just putting your mind in a different, more wholesome, karmically positive way. Um, but also bodhicitta in a way helps us move closer to wisdom because it's sort of diminishing our self-focus and um, I don't know, so that, that just thought occurred to me also. Yeah, in a in a perfect world, they're mutually reinforcing. 
that the more you think about emptiness, the more compassion, loving, kindness, bodhicitta makes sense. And the more compassion, loving, kindness, bodhicitta makes sense, the more you want to meditate on emptiness in order to cut the root of samsara so that you can go on to be of greater benefit to sentient beings. Yeah, so they should they should do that kind of symbiosis or somehow mutually reinforcing. Yeah, definitely. This is wonderful so far. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan. Yeah. Maureen, do you have any thoughts that are coming up when we look at the first noble truth that you feel comfortable sharing? Um, I haven't um, listened to some uh, Buddha teachings in a long time. Um, and I've been really in a, in a bad space since October when um, I got a car accident. Mm -hmm. My car got totaled and I'm in physical pain <laughs> still yeah so um when i got this email i'm all you know this, this might be something you know beneficial for me yeah and um the suffering from change is like i could totally relate to that i uh, very rarely have that calm mm. whatever peace yeah. and I was actually feeling it a little bit tonight um I um signed up for this uh 28 day meditation challenge by Sharon Salzberg mm. which I ran out of time last night to listen to and and I listened to it before this but that has nothing to do with what you were talking about I I I just what they're they're saying in the 12 step programs to let go, let God, and that's where my mind went. My issue is, and that's the I think the step three, I keep taking it back. Yeah. Try to let go, but no, oh, I gotta take it back or or whatever. And and I'm I'm doing it and it's an insanity. So um I, I I just try to keep an open mind. I, I'm glad to listen tonight. I might get up and move around because it's hard for my back. Totally. Uh, to sit for too long from the car accident. So I didn't know if I should turn off my video to do that so I'm not distracting. Um, but um, I, I kind of, when you were talking about like the beach scene and how like you're content, it's like I could see myself doing that because I do it with whatever. Yeah. You know, I get, I get the, the, I, the, what did it call The ants, the automatic negative thought pattern thing. Yeah. And at least I'm aware I'm doing it. It's just, you yeah. know, how to stop and regroup and recenter and not react or whatever yeah so and part of it is is realizing that you're not alone you know I think there can be that underlying assumption that that other people don't do this or other people get to happiness more and we're all so good at putting on a good face or a facade or you know tv programs resolve themselves at the end or movies resolve themselves at the end as if life were that tidy and it just isn't but if you're sort of you know, being really authentic and real with your mental and physical state, you're very easy to say, yeah, I'm suffering, but you guys seem fine. What are you doing? You guys seem fine. And they realize that in a way, nobody's fine. And we're just, you know, have better moments of putting on the facade. Nobody's really fine if they're in samsara. We're functioning, maybe. And maybe when we're connected to our Buddha nature, there's a type of confidence that comes that's not based on having achieved anything. It's a confidence that comes from knowing that the mind is trainable and that in some ways you're wiser than you once were, you know, and you can look back and think of your, you know, crazy teenage self or your, you know, sort of manic 20s or whatever it was and realize there are things you understand about humanity and life that you didn't know before. And that gives you confidence that the mind is trainable. 
And of course, sometimes change isn't linear. And sometimes there are things you once knew and forgot and went down the wrong path for a long time. But you can always circle back to the wisdom you once had. And you come back to it from a deeper place because you have more information now as you age. So when we're looking at this suffering, it's it's first just feeling some kind of kinship and connection with other human beings and with other beings that have a mind and realizing we're all just kind of stumbling along, trying to make the best of it, not really sure how to get happy consistently. We know how to get happy for a minute. We're experts at getting happy for a minute. We can use any number of substances, any number of foods, any number of activities, and we can get ourselves happy for five to 10 minutes, no problem. We all have strategies to do that. But then what? You know, after that five to 10 minutes, what do you do next? And how do you really take control and ownership of your own mind and take the power back away from the objects, away from the scenarios you think you need, while at the same time having the common sense that knows you can't just go cold turkey on life and be like, I don't need people. People are just conditions, not causes. And you're like, well, actually, no, we're still new in this path. We still need people to a certain extent. But eventually you get to the point where you realize specific people are no longer the ones you need it's just people in general but you know very early in the path you might think i need this this and this friend otherwise i can't be happy or this this and this relative otherwise i'll be devastated and gradually you realize there are people that serve those functions all over the world in any context and if you're feeling open and spacious you can connect to anybody you know, so it's it's a gradual process and you can't force it, but you can use the wisdom you already have and bring it up more often so it sticks better and then develops further. So you can use the fact of the mind being trainable. This is really what we're doing in Buddhism is training the mind out of bad habits into better habits and knowing that it has bad habits gives you more kindness towards yourself that you can't just change just like that. Even when you know better, you don't change right away. But you will eventually with consistent effort. You know, so can give you a bit of a break of why do I keep doing that even though I know better? Well, you're going to have to know better on purpose many times before you stop doing the opposite. But you will. You know, that's the good news. It's the good news. And you know, when, when we're looking at like the deep, deep reasons for suffering, then we're looking at true suffering in terms of the pervasive suffering. So the pervasive suffering, sometimes called um, compounded pervasive suffering or the suffering of conditionality, anyway, pervasive suffering, the suffering that pervades all experience within cyclic existence because we're under the control of karma and mental afflictions. So every feeling and the web of experience in which it is embedded is the product of karma and afflictions. Not only that, this moment of experience carries with it the potential in the form of afflictions for future suffering. So then we get strategic because we realize, all right, every form of existence, if it's in this cyclic existence of samsara, is going to be problematic every form of it. So we get strategic and we really ask ourselves questions about how can I stop making new causes? How can I stop making new causes for suffering? If the causes of suffering are ignorance, karma, disturbing emotions, all right, what do I actually have some control over? So we're going to look at the second noble truth a little bit, just because I think that will help. <clears throat> the first is just an attitude adjustment, right? Before you get into like the deep dive and antidotes and all these things, first just thinking of an attitude adjustment like this one in Lama Tripa. So it says, should even the environment and the beings therein be filled with the fruits of their karmic debts and unwished for sufferings pour down like rain, 
we seek your blessings to take these miserable conditions as a path by seeing them as causes to exhaust the results of our negative karma. So here the invitation is to look at the difficulties in your life right now and decide that you're not going to make it worse by creating causes for more of the same, that whatever suffering arises, you're going to think about how to use it as fuel for the path, fuel for transformation. You can also think of it as whatever suffering is arising right now is finishing old negative karma or exhausting the results of our negative karma. So for example, say something simple like a headache. Okay, if you, you we've created the cause for countless headaches in our past by basically disturbing the minds of others, etc. So you have a headache in this moment. Now, the habit is if you have a headache, also grumpy, like headache and grumpy go together. But you know, if you're having a, a day where you're really looking forward to something and it's really important to you, that you can kind of pivot out of the grumpy and just be having a headache and still also enjoying the thing you were looking forward to. Yeah, there's been days when mind over matter, right? And sometimes the headache just fades a little bit to the background. And sometimes it goes all together because you're having so much fun or you're so engaged mentally with what you have decided is important that the headache just goes away. But even if it doesn't go away, the volume goes down on the headache a bit. Okay, that's, you know, something we know about life in ourselves, that sometimes we can focus in such a way that the physical pain becomes less prominent. But what if the physical pain just is not cooperating? It's just hurting. One of the things you can think is, this pain is finishing, never to come again. It's only going to come again in this exact form if I react to it with a negative state of mind or a negative behavior of speech or a negative behavior of body. So if I have a pain arise and I allow anger to settle in, then I'm creating the cause for more pain in the future. If the pain arises and I choose to not give in to the angry habit, maybe you have a moment of grumpiness arise and you catch it while it's small enough and it dies a natural death, then that seed finishes. It's kind of like a passive purification. You know, you can do active purification to proactively purify, but in this way, it's kind of like you're finishing negative karma. Yeah, Jordan. Yeah, I've been meditating on pain myself uh, for the last uh, month. Um, uh, as I was sharing with uh, Vinal Yantin before you joined, Maureen, I had knee surgery two and a half weeks ago, total knee replacement. And, um, you know, I've caught myself just as you just said, um, venerable um, groaning and sort of bemoaning. It's like in the middle of the night, it's like, oh, this pain again, you know, why can't I sleep? And you know, and it's, and it's a form of subtle resistance. Um, and uh, I remember one of my teachers many years ago talking about how to be skillful working with pain. Like, I mean, if the pain is the proverbial 800 pound weight, um, it's not easy to use mind training when, unless we're at a very high level of, of concentration, you know, and, and, uh, it would be skillful to use analgesics at that point of some kind to dull the pain or or even distract yourself with a movie or a good book you know yeah. um uh but but nonetheless you know um this is so key what what venerable is saying right now um you know i i know deep inside that this um experience I'm going through for the last month with my knee and this injury and all the pain is a profound opportunity to purify this negative karma so it doesn't arise again and how I respond to it in each moment um, is really important you know just to look at the old habit patterns yeah yeah and it, I mean it's 
sort of when it's in your face, when it's a coarse pain that's like really palpably present that you can't really escape, you know, it's not like, you know, you've got a little tweak of a stone in your shoe and you can sort of distract yourself until you have time to get it out of your shoe when it's really like a big pain. It's like it might as well be your practice because it's going to pull focus anyway. It might as well be your practice, you know. I mean, oh, it's like a meditation retreat right now. Absolutely. The last month, you know. Absolutely. And and I think, you know, what you said before, taking an analgesic, if you can distract yourself, if you can, it's like use different strategies, because probably the same one is not going to work consistently. I don't know if you ever had this experience with when you get a tolerance to something, but, you know, I had chronic migraines as a teenager and, you know, maybe the first set of ibuprofen, if I got it just at the right time, might prevent or help or ease but more was not going to make it any better. It would just stop working. You know, it wouldn't matter how much I took. I would just make my stomach hurt or make my liver crap out, but I wouldn't get less of a migraine. Yeah. Or like you could watch one movie, but if you watch 10 movies, you know, you're going to fry your eyes out and, you know, get exhausted and whatever, whatever. You know, so if you're thinking, I'm going to do some forms of pain management that are just relaxation, doing something distracting, I'm going to do some that are just practical, making sure I'm drinking enough water and eating healthy and taking pain medication at the right time in the right way. And I'm also going to use spiritual path methods because that is actually the cheapest and most effective way to get through pain. It's just you don't have the mental fortitude to do it all day and expecting yourself to do it all day is too much pressure, you know? So it's like, all right, so for a few... You know, you think, all right, maybe the painkiller lasts six hours, but like on the tail end of that six hours, it's starting to wear off in that little pocket before I can take another dose. That's going to be my hour of practice. You know, not all day. That's too much pressure. So you think, yes, one, this pain is finishing old negative karma. If I respond with patience, I'm not creating more of the same. That is really useful, actually. The other piece is I can use this pain to broaden my understanding of the human experience. And even to use the tendency to get grumpy or morose or sort of a bit just, you know, melancholy sometimes with pain, sometimes grumpy, you know, you kind of go back and forth between melancholy, grumpy, melancholy, grumpy, right? And if you're using just that feeling of knowing the tendency to get a bit despair or to get a bit angry, to widen your understanding and patience of people. Because when people are badly behaved in our daily life, our habit is not to think what's going on for them that's creating such turmoil that they would behave badly. Our, our usual thought is, why are they being so rude? I'm a nice person. I don't deserve this. Or why are they being so rude? I must have created the cause in the past, but obviously not in the present because I'm a nice person or whatever, whatever, you know, we're, we're like dancing around trying to figure out what's wrong with them in terms of their behavior instead of what's wrong with them in terms of the suffering that drove that behavior. So if you're thinking of the suffering that might have driven the rude person's behavior, then compassion arises just naturally. Like if you've just had a terrible migraine and then someone at work says, I have a terrible migraine and they're a little bit, I don't know, entitled, a little bit impatient, a little bit indulgent. They're a little obnoxious together with their migraine. It might still be aggravating, but there's part of you that really does understand deeply why they might have given in to those afflictions. Because just the day before, that was a danger for you. Do you know what I mean? So you're using your suffering to open up your understanding of the human condition like a scientist. Thinking, wow, it is so much harder for me to focus when I feel this way. Or it's so much harder for, for me to be in control of my mood when I feel this way. That knowledge is useful because the same is true of other people. You know, like, don't lose the lesson that the suffering is offering you, even though it didn't mean to, even though it's not like its own sentience or something. It's But like, 
see the lesson for what it is. This is what suffering does to me. I don't have as much control. I don't have as much focus. I don't have as much energy. And the same is true of all sentient beings. Okay. The, the look is different person to person, but the baseline thing is the same. If people are not behaving well, it is because they're not doing well. We already knew that. We've known that for decades. But when it's right in your face and you've got a rude person there, we forget that, of course, they're rude if they're in pain. Happy people are not usually rude, <laughs> right? So it, it's just kind of using the pain in lots of good ways. The, the you know, the pro level work, of course, is to do Tong Len, to do giving and taking practice and to think, all right, this pain that I'm experiencing that I do not want, I actually do want. I want it and I want tomorrow's version and next month's version and all of the pain of this type. I actually want all of this pain and I'm going to give it to the self-cherishing attitude of selfishness, self-centeredness. And what's more, I want everyone else's as well. My Zoom screen just went crazy. I don't know why. <laughs> why I did my Zoom screen? Was it doing this? No, that didn't work. <laughs> the AI. So when you're doing Tong Len, you know, you're doing giving and taking, it's counterintuitive. You know, it's the very thing you do not want. So for Jordans, it would be like, I do not want my knees to hurt. I actually, let me take all of that knee pain and give it to where it came from. It came from the self-cherishing thought. Give it back to the self-cherishing thought. And actually, all of my happiness and all of my roots of virtue and all of the good resources in my life, they came from positive karma in interaction with sentient beings. If I have abundance, it's because I was generous, but I was only generous because there was someone to be generous towards or have a mental attitude of generosity towards. So my happiness came from sentient beings. May I give it back to sentient beings? So, of course, this is just on the level of attitude. Yeah, it's it's only a very unique case where Tonglen is literal. But if you're adopting this attitude of actually, I want this pain. And actually, the happiness I have, I give it over. That's some pro-level spiritual practice. And it's a lot more powerful when you have an actual pain to be working with. You know, so, you know, you can do that for a little bit. Don't do it for too long. Don't burn yourself out. But Tonglen in the moment of pain can be one of the most powerful things. You're like, I want this pain and I want everyone else's also. But I'm going to give it to the self-cherishing attitude and I'm going to think of the self-cherishing attitude as like this shell around my good, kind heart that blocks me from connection and warmth towards others. I always have this beautiful, kind heart. I always have this Buddha nature. I always have loving kindness and compassion, but it gets blocked. It gets stifled by self-centeredness. So think of it as like a little shell. And then when you breathe in your suffering and everyone else's suffering, think that it cracks that shell or dissolves that shell so that your good, kind heart is out again. And that all of your happiness and roots of virtue going out to sentient beings, well, it fills you up too. It's not going to end. You're not going to run out. But if you adopt the attitude of not being attached to the good in your life, then you don't suffocate the good in your life. And you're also not trapped by the good in your life in the sense of thinking you need to have it in order to be happy. Yeah, you take the power back from it. And also it increases your gratitude because you realize your good karma has been based on relationships, has been based on other sentient beings to practice in response to. So Tonglen practice can be one of the most beneficial things to do with suffering, but, you know, at your own speed in a way that doesn't feel too much pressure, just gently, gently. So when we're looking at the first two noble truths, it's kind of like this. It's like suffering, the first noble truth, leads to the generation of karma and disturbing emotions. Karma and disturbing emotions then lead to more suffering, right? So the first round, suffering, body, speech, mind, you know, is going to react to suffering. 
your body, speech, and mind is going to react to suffering. It's used to reacting in a negative way and planting the seeds of more negative karma. Then the negative karma ripens as more suffering. That's what usually happens. That's re really just the habitual response. But what we're trying to do is to break this pattern at either end. Doesn't matter where you break it. It's just having the mental space to try. So the classic way is between suffering turning into disturbing emotions, you break it here by not allowing the suffering to trigger a negative state of mind or to trigger a damaging action of body, speech, and mind. Prevention. Yeah. And when you prevent, then that suffering finishes and you don't create more of the same. But you might miss your window right? You might miss your window and suffering does turn into karma and disturbing emotions, planting seeds for possible future suffering. So we, you can also break it here between disturbing emotions turning into suffering. So it's too late. You got grumpy. You, you know, allowed it. It got its feet in. It got its teeth in, however you want to frame it. You really are in a bad mood. You're planting negative karmic seeds. How to stop them from becoming suffering in the future is to purify, to purify. So what you do is you think genuinely, honestly, what has happened today that was not in alignment with your path? And the real root of purification is recognizing a fault to be a fault. Simple as that, right? So you think anger is negative, because anger is the wish to harm. The wish to harm is always negative. And nevertheless, I was triggered by my suffering into that state of mind. And even if I was polite about it, I was showing a grumpy face at someone, or I was withholding affection for someone. And all of that was very subtle, but it had an element of a punishing attitude in there. A punishing attitude. So it was anger. So you just think anger is negative. I regret anger. And then you think of some way to clear that energy. You can think of something traditional like the Vajrasattva practice where you have the white deity above the crown of your head and white light flowing down together with the mantra, Om Vajrasattva Hum, or the long one. That's a really good remedy. But you can also think of other remedies that are more, you know, everyday to you. That's okay. Or other mantras that you like. And then the final step is to think, what is a reasonable way to not allow this again in a time-specific way that's not setting yourself up for failure? Yeah, you think, okay, tomorrow I might feel this way again. Tomorrow when I feel this way again, here's my strategy. And you play it out. And you think, okay, I'm going to get a bit irritable around 3 p.m. when the painkiller starts wearing off or when my blood sugar starts going down or, you know, just that afternoon schlump. Okay, that's a time where I'm likely to get irritated. So I'm just going to make a tiny, simple plan for tomorrow, which is that tomorrow I'm going to make sure I've done meal prep in such a way that I can eat at good times to not have that blood sugar dip. Or when I feel a bit of irritability, I'm going to take myself for a short walk, or I'm going to watch a silly comedy, or I'm going to pet the cat. doesn't matter, but you make a tiny plan for yourself. If you say, I'm not going to get irritable in response to suffering ever again, you're setting yourself up for failure. But if you think tomorrow at three, that's tangible. That's possible. And it's a bit like 12 step. Yeah, it's one day at a time. And, you know, day after day, one day at a time, that leads to a whole continuity of really good days. But if you think about all of those days, you'll overwhelm yourself and freak out and not even get through this one. You know, so you take it tiny chunks, tiny chunks that are small enough for you to really get your head around. And that is the way to purify negative karma. It's called the four opponent powers. So you're just connecting with your spiritual refuge you're generating a sense of just nice, clean regret. You're doing a remedy, and then you make a resolve. And the thing about regret is that it is not guilt. 
guilt is strangely egocentric because sometimes guilt says the payment I pay for doing the wrong thing is feeling bad. Therefore, I'm allowed to keep doing the wrong thing as long as I feel bad about it. That's what guilt says. And so guilt is nonsense and guilt does not help in the spiritual path. Yeah, it's like, I'll just keep paying the price of feeling horrible so I don't have to change. Yeah. Regret is just kind of simple and direct. It goes, oh, that's a fault. I don't want to do that. You know, like the way that you would feel if you were carrying a glass of water across the living room and you spilled a little bit of water, you would think, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. You wouldn't think I am a bad person. I should feel bad. You would just think, oh, whoops, it was too full. I'll have a little sip. You know, it wouldn't be a whole drama. Yeah, it would just be, oh, whoops, that's not what I meant to do. So when you're thinking about your own faults, it's somehow identifying them without identifying with them. Yeah, and that's the key part, because if you think this is me, this is who I am, then it becomes a whole trap and a whole story and a whole drama. If you think this is just something that arose out of habit and causes and conditions, but it's not me, then it's workable. Then you can gradually change it and let it go. <clears throat> Yeah, I like that. All right, so any any questions about those two before we do a little meditation? Little meditation? Okay, so we'll just do a very gentle meditation on the first two noble truths, mainly the first one, with the idea that the better we identify it, the easier it'll be to get rid of it. Yeah. So just starting with a nice posture that feels comfortable and feels stable. Take a moment and just be in your body. And then shift your focus to the breath to let surface distractions settle. Just nice and simple. Awareness of the breath. You can focus at the stomach where it rises and falls or at the nostrils where you can feel the air pass through. Now revive your motivation, thinking the reason I'm doing this meditation is in order to develop my mind to its fullest potential so that I can be of greatest benefit to all living beings, including myself. And shifting the mind to analysis, first think about this first noble truth, this truth of suffering. Really clarify and identify it for yourself. 
there is suffering physically and mentally. This is built into the nature of cyclic existence. This is the way my body and mind will have an experience because they're under the influence of karma and disturbing emotions. And so we think in samsara, in this cyclic existence, there is a lack of certainty. A lack of certainty. Difficult to find things to rely upon. Finding stability. And this is just built into a samsaric experience. Lack of certainty. Some rebirths were human. Some rebirths were something else. Not tidy or linear. Just cause and effect. And there's the suffering of insatiability. That feeling that things are never enough. Even when you get what you want, always wanting more. It's said that we've drunk our mother's milk enough to fill all the oceans countless times. And we're still not satisfied. We've been at the peak of existence. We've had every experience, every kind of holiday, every kind of substance, every kind of romance, every kind of food, every kind of music. We've had everything Simsar has to offer countless times, and it still doesn't feel like enough because it's all under the influence of karma and disturbing emotions. And we have the suffering of discarding this body and being reborn again and again. We just get used to the way one body works and then you have to get a new one. Again and again. Some of them stable and strong, reliable bodies. Some of them vulnerable bodies. At this stage in our development, the bodies we take are not under our control. And there's the suffering of going from high to low, both within samsara and also within one life. You go through school and get to the top, and the top of one grade becomes the bottom of the next school. Maybe you get to fifth grade and you're the big kid, and then you go to middle school and sixth grade, you're the little kid. And you get all the way up to eighth grade and you're the big kid. You get to high school and you're a freshman. You're the youngin. And then you get to college and you're a freshman. And then you get into the workplace and you're the newbie. And you work your way up. And you achieve something, some kind of reputation, some respect. And even if you get to the very pinnacle of your career, at some point, they'll think you're too old and out of touch. 
and be at the bottom again. And in samsara, we lack companions in the sense that we are born alone and we die alone. Our experiences are individual. We can be each other's companion in one sense, but we can never fully share another's experience, nor can they share ours. We have these six types of suffering. We also have the three types of suffering, and the eight types of suffering, so many lists of suffering. And what we think is there is no difference between ourselves and others. None of us wishes even the slightest of sufferings or is even content with the happiness we have. Realizing this, we seek your blessings, they may enhance the bliss and joy of others. So just be with that for a moment, the truth of suffering, and also the fact that it's not unique the way that we experience suffering, fundamentally that there's no difference between ourselves and others, that none of us wishes the slightest of suffering or is content with the happiness we do have. Let this knowledge touch you and make you curious about the causes of suffering, your innate ignorance, karma, disturbing emotions. May we have the mindfulness and the bodhicitta and the wisdom to stop creating causes for future suffering and to purify the causes we've already created. And so out of a healthy fear or apprehension of what this untamed mind can create, and out of a healthy faith or conviction that the Buddha and his teachings and his community can support us getting out of this mess, think that the Buddha appears in the space in front of you, radiant, golden, looking directly at you and simultaneously at all sentient beings with a compassionate gaze. And think he sends nectar light, blessing your mind, in the form of golden light that comes from his heart, curves in an arc to the crown of your head, and golden light goes through you and fills you up, blessing your body, speech, and mind. So 
The nectar light continues to flow into you. And then the Buddha dissolves into light and absorbs into you, blessing your body, speech, and mind. And we dedicate the merits of the class. Jan Chu Sam Cho Rinpo She Mba Khe Pa Dam Khe Gyu Chi E Pa Nyam Pa Me Pa Yang Gon He Gon Du Pa Wa Sho Toni Da Wa Rinpo She Mba Khe Pa Dam Khe Gyu Chi E Pa Nyam Pa Me Pa Yang Gon He Gon Du Pa Wa Sho Okay. Great. Thanks very much.